Okay, I really didn't expect people to go for this option as much as they did. I threw the ghosts in the garage option in there because I felt like there should be a third option. Honestly, I thought the one about how me and my family were vacationing in this beach house and it got struck by lightning would be the winner. But okay, those who know me well know that I have no problem talking about my book. Y'all never cease to surprise me. So, Ghosts in the Garage was most voted for, and here it is. The video of my dreams. The video where I get to talk about my beloved series uninterrupted, even if the people watching it get bored of me rambling halfway through. It's still out there. I still made it. There's no one that can stop me. <laughs> <clears throat> but first, before I start my long narrative, it means the world to me that there are a thousand people out there who click that subscribe button. Seriously, I'm so flattered. I will continue to make as much quality content as I can muster. While talking about it, I decided to record a speed paint where I redraw a poster that I painted back in senior year art class, which was well over a year ago, and because it'll be digital, it should definitely be better than the original. One final thing, if you happen to want to help me finish paying off the book, I will be happy to accept PayPal donations. I've decided that anyone who donates anything over $5, including anyone who has before donated to me, gets their name, username, or real name in the credits of the book trailer, which will come out in a few days before the book, so I may provide pre-order links. It would be a big help, and I'd be really thankful. Now, for my whole process with writing Ghosts in the Garage. It all started maybe when I was 10 or 11, maybe 12, I don't remember which. This is sort of around the same time my dad had published his book series. My dad, Jeremy Cook, has a book out called The Illusion Stick. I don't know where you can find it anymore, but if you ever do, I'd recommend giving it a read. I think I remember my mom saying that he's about to get the rights back to it so that he would be able to get some money out of it, possibly, if anyone were to buy it. He's a lot better at writing than me in my opinion, but his series never got much attention because his company didn't really do any promotion. That's why I over-promote my series, especially since I'm paying for it to come out through Austin Macaulay. I want to see it out there. As connected to the hip as I am with Ghosts in the Garage, I constantly worry about whether or not it's as good as I think it is, and once it's finally published, I will make sure to stress that anyone who reads it can be 100% honest with me, that it won't hurt my feelings if they have negative opinions of it. At this point, it's almost two years old, and there's a lot of stuff that's only going to worsen with age. On a side note, I'll be sure to give you guys the info when my dad starts putting stuff out on Wattpad or wherever, which he told me he's looking into trying. I feel like he's too modest about his skills, and he could definitely use the attention on his work. Anywho, back to the beginning. We lived in this row home for a good portion of my childhood. It was kind of a crummy building and started breaking down around us by the time we moved out when I was 14, but I did have a lot of good memories there. We had a garage, which we gave up on trying to use for parking because it would always end up cluttered. It became even more cluttered when a couple family members gave us this pool table. I remember spending many days playing pool. I don't remember being good at it, but it was what I usually did when hanging out with friends. I remember making up my own version of pool where instead of pool sticks, you just sling the cue ball at other people and knock them out. <laughs> you just sling the cue ball at other balls to knock them in the box. I'm not even going to edit that out. That's too funny. Just imagine being hit upside the head with a cue ball. Well, that's not very funny once you imagine it, but like, <laughs> I promise I didn't throw cue balls at people when I was younger. <laughs> at the time, I had this next door neighbor who I'll just call D. One day, we were playing pool and stuff, and this random thing sitting towards the back fell over. Dee said, oh, look at that, there's a ghost in your garage. I can't really say why this turned into a story of some sort, but it did. Once Dee went back over his house, I went up in my room and started writing stuff down. Character names, the plot points, and it was pretty bad. <laughs> Here's all the details I remember from the first part. I'll try to be as chronological as possible. First off, it wasn't what it is now. I took my house using the actual neighborhood and address I lived at, so if it was somehow published, everyone would know where I lived. And the main character was named Tyler. She was still a girl. She was a girl named Tyler. I tried justifying it by saying her name was Tillette, or Tylet or something like that, and she just preferred going by Tyler because Tylet is a stupid name. And she was basically a ripoff of me. I was really into skateboarding, which lasted maybe a few months. I'd skateboard to my bus stop to go to school. There was this car garage out back of my house with this hill where I'd skate down. Truth be told, this was also the time I didn't know how to ride a bike. I didn't learn until I was like 13. Pretty stupid, right? I think I was scared of bikes or something, and that's why I didn't learn until then. 
So the story started with Mini-Me, I mean Tyler, skateboarding down an alleyway, which I wrote to be the exact same route as what I took to my bus station, running into this gold coin and crashing, picking up the gold coin, saying, oh, that's pretty neat, and continuing on with her day. She comes back home, and suddenly, there's a ghost woman in her garage. The ghost woman says, hey, you have my coin somehow. Now I'm going to take your parents. Oh, look, there they go, right into the void. What void? Tyler asks. The void. Oh, no. So the ghost tells this 12-year-old girl to travel the world, gather the rest of her treasures, and bring them back to her in order to get her parents back. So she calls up her aunt, who was based off my Aunt Sandy. All of the characters pretty much were based off people in my life. My parents, my aunt, my cousin, my brother, and my grandmother. Tyler was like, hey, mom and dad got chucked into a void. Can you take me on this worldwide exploration to find these treasures and get them back to her? Of course, Tyler. I'm going to also take your 8-year-old cousin with us. And off they went to... somewhere. I forgot where. And off they went to... somewhere. I forgot where. I don't even remember if there was an antagonist in this that halts their trip until the second book. And yes, I made it to a second book before I realized how bad it was. This is where Zack and Marco 1.0 show up. I don't remember what Marco's name was originally, but I know Zack stayed the same basically the entire time. It was like the only name I had that wasn't weird. There was no such thing as the Ghost Council or the Cloak Magician City. It was just them. Basically, Tyler and her aunt and cousin are checking into this hotel. Tyler goes to hang out outside this hotel, which happens to be outside a dangerous jungle where she almost gets blown up by a trap set by Marco, but Zack jumps in to save her. And Tyler's like, oh wow, a mysterious stranger, because I'm pretty sure I based Zack off of a crush I had at that time. The current Zack is based off of Timmy, which is why it's not a spoiler to say that Zack and Skylar end up together by the end. Tyler leaves to go into the jungle where the treasure is supposed to be without the help of her family members. Zack follows her. She asks why. Because I can't stop thinking of you, Zack says. <laughs> oh, okay. Who are you again? She replies, and that's basically all I remember from the second book. I think a year passed and I realized it was garbage and started on a new version that's somewhat like the current one, only it was terrible. Skylar was renamed Skylar, but Zack had a British accent that was super edgy for basically no reason, and believed Marco was his father until Marco told him that he was actually his uncle. Why? I don't know. I had no clue why I thought that'd be an interesting plot twist or really any relevance to the story. I actually still have some of the old versions with me. <clears throat> Here's an excerpt. Why bother hiding something like that from your nep nephew? I've only seen enough situations where the devious uncle murders the nephew to gain something, but usually on movies. At least I was self-aware of how dumb this revelation was. The ghost council in the cloak magician city appeared. Skylar got a talking dog sidekick named Russ, who was based off of my real-life dog I had, and the ghost council was located in a shed that was outside of her house. Which was no longer my house, probably because I no longer lived there at the time, and because I didn't want people to come to my actual house to tell me that how bad my book was. Her house got blown up by the cloak magicians, so Rust, her brother Tony, who popped into existence, her cousin, her grandmother, and her aunt fled into the ghost council. Her parents were made into anthropologists who travel the world, because what kind of story has actual parents that are there for the child protagonist? So they were off having a good old time while their daughter is in danger. That's kind of the truth with the current one, too, only they rush back home when it happens. They got into the ghost council before they were caught. Marco was like, oh damn, I can't get past this door, and then promptly gave up, making him a useless antagonist. Zack agreed that he was useless and went to join the ghost council. He managed to open the door and closed it quickly before Marco could get in. My dad, after reading this new story, told me to make the antagonist a little more... antagonisty. Which is why Marco just kind of blows some old man's head off his shoulders for no reason in the current draft. I jumped from barely doing anything to oh my god stop and I don't love it. That's probably going to be something the editors are going to change just a little bit. In hindsight, I do regret giving him that power. I'm just going to make it so that he forgets to use it half the time. I think I took a break from it for a while because I was going through a hard time in my life. Ninth grade year was not my best. But once that break ended is when I started rewriting it for a final time. This time, I definitely felt more confident about actually publishing it. My dad really liked the improvements. Marco doesn't just appear, twist his mustache and cackle, and then disappear again, he said. Or something like that. And overall, I felt like there's less plot holes. 
but there are still plot holes that I tend to try to fix in later books. Here's a synopsis for the story that is actually being published right now. You'd probably see there's a lot of stuff I decided to keep from the originals that I felt particularly fond of, or at least tweaked to be better adjusted. Skylar Russell, a 14-year-old girl who resides in Texas, stumbles across a coin on her walk to school, but by the time Skylar gets to school, it is attacked by the cloak magicians. Despite being aware that she had some obviously weird traits, she's confused when Marco calls her a magician or Skylar Rue and challenges her to a battle to the death. So she runs, but she's caught when Marco decides to start strangling Zack and she jumps down from the tree she's hiding in to help him, and they take her back to the Cloak Magician City where she gets recruited by Marco to be a Cloak Magician after spending a few hours in a prison cell with a war dog who explains magic and who she really is, a Rue, a powerful family in magic. That's why Marco decided to recruit her instead of killing her. Her, Zack, and Russ escape to the Ghost Council where Skylar struggles to grasp the concept that she's no longer just a normal girl in a normal family. She's conflicted about her parents for keeping the secret from her, but she doesn't have enough time to be conflicted when she finds out that her brother Tony had tried to go to the Cloak Magician City to get her back and had been captured. She goes on a mission with Zack and some newly made Ghost Council friends to get him back. That's how the first book goes. I left out a lot of things so there would be more to read, obviously. I have decided at this point that eventually I want to make an animated series of this, maybe once the second book is out. And the second book will be read in Zack's point of view, but also bits of his past narrated from a third person perspective. Him and Skylar alternate narrating each book until the fifth and final one, which they both narrate in alternating chapters. But with each one there will be progressively more tidbits of third person and various other characters and happenings. I feel like I've added a lot of cliché issues into this, I'm just owning it and saying it was on purpose for comic effect, making fun of cliché stereotypes, but really, I don't know. I'm trying to take it one step at a time, but it's so frustrating waiting for so long just for the first one to come out, you know? I'm focusing on paying for the first book and completing an effective animated trailer for it that would hopefully promote it. I guess this video hopefully promotes it as well? Now be prepared, I'm about to start thanking a whole bunch of important people. Like the voice actors in the trailer who were working with me to get this project done. They've submitted their lines pretty quickly and did an excellent job with them. Here are some previews of their work. Life must be spontaneous for it to truly be life. Until we find out what this all means, we need to stick together. No, 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 my dear. We're going to kill you. If you fail, I get to laugh. I want to thank my parents who acted as the first editing crew and for helping me fund this, since I currently don't have a job. My grandfather has also helped with that too. I don't know if he'd see this video. I'm afraid I don't express either to him or to my parents how much I really appreciate them, not just for this book, but for my life and what they've done to take care of me and support me. There's never been a day when I've went hungry and all the dreams and goals I pursue in life, they've gone with it and net given me everything that I need. Even now when I'm living on my own, well, not on my own, if I'd be living on my own, I'd be screwed. None of this would have been possible without any of them. I'm always going to be thankful to have such a supportive family. And I want to thank all of you for your interest. I really hope it won't be a disappointment for you when the day finally comes that it's out. If it is, though, I want complete and total honesty and constructive criticism so that my other books may improve from the first one's mistakes. I'll definitely keep all of you updated about it. Every time I pay some of it, I update the description default to inform you all of how much is left. My PayPal is in the description as well if anyone is looking to donate. Over the past two years, when I've been involved in the YouTube communities the most, I've met so many individuals that left such a big impact on me. Thank you all so much for watching and hearing me out. Thank you for the 1,000 subscribers, and thank you. Just thank you. Seriously, I can't find the words to express how much this all means to me. I'll see you all next time. Bye!